Hey, good day. My name is Simmer Werk. I'm a pre extension precision ag specialist at University of Georgia and today I'll be talking about some sprayer considerations as well as some spray technology to do more effective pesticide applications, how to kind of optimize your spray performance. So we'll walk through some of the initial sprayer considerations on the machine or what all to check for and then also share some of the technology options that are available to be more efficient with your pesticide applications. So the first thing I'm going to cover is very basic thing which a lot of growers you know depending on the time of the season is Make sure you start with a very clean sprayer equipment and check all the parts on the sprayer itself and that will include, can I move to the sprayer? That will include checking your plumb lines, hoses, your nozzles and everything while the sprayer sits through the season from the previous spraying, you know, it can accumulate a lot of particles, dust or any of the material you have probably previously sprayed and not uh, cleaned out properly. So make sure that everything is working and clean so you start clean before the season. The second thing I wanna emphasize is what we're targeting here is the application rate always. We're trying to uh, spray this target application rate and if we talk about application rate, there's so many variables that affect it but the top two or three are your nozzle flow rate, your ground speed, and your spacing. That's what making you get that desired rate in the field. So your speed, your nozzle flow rate, and your swat. So make sure you do a really good check of what your nozzle spacing looks like on the boom when you're trying to calculate. Most of the growers, we can be anywhere from 15, 18, or 20 inches. Uh, on this sprayer, we're about 20 inches right here. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is when we talk about effective or more efficient pesticide application, like I said, we're targeting that application rate, but it's not that rate that if we're meeting, we're doing a good job of spraying that pesticides. I think the two most important things beside rate is the coverage and the efficacy. And the coverage depends on the nozzle selection, nozzle type, your speed, all these variables, even the wind environment you're spraying in. So you also need to make sure what type of coverage you're getting in and the efficacy is kind of directly dependent on coverage. You can be spraying the target rate you want to, but if you're not getting the desired coverage, you're not getting the efficacy out of the chemical you're spraying. So next we'll talk about nozzle selection because that's one of the most important questions growers ask or we always when we, select, when we want to select the right nozzle. And one thing that sometimes we don't pay too much attention to is the very first thing in the nozzle selection part is check the label. Whatever product you're spraying, check if it's a contact or systemic type application or does the label have any requirements. So I have, there are these um, labels for herbicides, fungicides, insecticides that I have printed here and if you if you look through the label, label here you'll see that on the herbicide side because of the recent drift issues and more efficient applications the, the companies have included more and more information whether it's the ground speed, the drift considerations, the droplet size and that's where you want to start with what's the desired application rate, what's the speed they're telling you not to spread over, is there a selected nozzle type they're recommending to make this application, or generally they have the pressure or the droplet size in there. Don't spray this using a medium to coarse droplet between 30 to 60 pressure. So that's what you're looking for as a starting point when you're selecting a type of nozzles. Now, like I said earlier, your Liberty and Dicamba, these will have a lot more detailed instructions on your speed, a nozzle selection. They even have a recommended nozzles, but when it comes to our fungicides and insecticides, I mean, the only information we have in these labels is spray medium to coarse droplets. Well, guess what? I have 10 different nozzles that can do medium to uh, coarse droplets, so that, but it's a good starting point. That means that you can al almost rule out 
all the nozzles that can do fine or extra large droplets. All right, when you start looking at nozzle selection, um, there are a few different things to consider. When we start looking at nozzle selection, there are a few different things to consider. Fortunately, our chemical industry or the spray industry, we have a lot of good standards. So we have a standard, we have a color coding for the nozzle size. We also have a color coding for the nozzle type. So as an example, I'll show first what there's a different brands of nozzles out there, but how to kind of know what nozzle or spray tip you're using. If you look at, okay, if you see here, there are all the information you need on a nozzle or spray tip. So your first will tell you this is XR extended range, nozzle brand T-Jet, Wilger, High Pro, whatever, but this is the information you're looking for more. The 110, there are 110, 80, uh, 80 or 110 angle nozzle. So your 110 is the fan or spray angle. And then 04 is the strip, uh, tip size there, which means that this nozzle at 40 PSI does 0.4 gallons per minute, each nozzle. And then also VS is usually the nozzle material. There can be different types of material. So when we're looking at this, this journal, work, when you're reading your nozzle or selecting your nozzle, like I said, fortunately our spray industry is very, uh, have a very good standard. So we got all these different types of color coded nozzles which at 40 psi does not matter what brand nozzle you're using at 40 psi if you have this color nozzle its output should be 0 0.10 0 0.15 0 0.2 so that's a really good way when you're looking for uh, selecting a nozzle the next thing um, we're looking at is when you're selecting a nozzle let's say the label has a recommendation on the application rate and the <clears throat> the application rate and the, maybe the spray pressure or the droplet size so every manufacturer has this chart that comes with the nozzles that you can get from them that have all their nozzles the operating pressure and what's the application rate at different speeds so this is like a standard that the t-jet provides so i'm just using that as a reference here so let's say I'll walk you through why when I said that when you're trying to do a, when the label says you want to do a medium to coarse droplet, there are a lot of different ways you can achieve that, but we want to optimize or you want to maximize, we want to select a nozzle that's perfect for that operation with the best desired rate, coverage, and also minimum spray drift. So as an example, we're trying to we're trying to select a nozzle that can apply 7 gallons and 13 miles per hour. Well, guess what? When I start looking at my chart, there are five different ways of achieving that application rate at that speed. So what you usually want to do is when you're trying to read the nozzle, my 02, 025, 03, 035, and 04 all can all nozzles can do that rate but what you want to select the nozzle based on is you want to be right in the middle of the pressure range that nozzle is rated at so if it's giving you if if it's if you look at some of the top the yellow nozzle we have to achieve 90 psi pressure to meet that rate that's too high of a pressure and also if you notice we're on the very high end of that nozzle. So anytime our speed or application changes, the pressure is gonna change. So what we really wanna be, when you look at some of the brown or red nozzles, we're really on the lower end of the pressure. That means we can actually, we wanna find a nozzle where we would be the recommended right about the middle of the pressure range. So there are two nozzles that fit this selection criteria here is because we're right at 60 and 40. If we, if I have to select a nozzle here, I would usually go with the 40 because it's a little lower pressure. Plus, I'm able to achieve that rate right in the middle of that pressure range that I'm targeting at. Other thing that when you're looking at is, so these charts, all, all this color coded, the, the colors here, but what we have is here, right here. So on this chart, 
TZ has it, not sure if for other manufacturers, but you can find this information very easily. Those droplets that those nozzles are producing, they're also color coded based on your fine droplet to extra coarse. So if you look across on here, our droplets from fine, as we go up, our color goes from red, orange, yellow, blue. So when a label says that spray medium to coarse droplets, you can almost come here at 03 and if you're spraying at 40 PSI, you see it's doing a very coarse droplet. That don't meet our criteria for that nozzle, even though you are spraying the same application rate at that speed. So what do you want to also look at is that whatever nozzle you selected, is it giving you that droplet size that the label actually calls for? So there's three or four different things to consider selecting that nozzle type um, based on what speed you're spraying at, what rate you're trying to achieve, what's your pressure goal. Try to stay in the middle of that pressure range where the nozzle is rated at and also look at what's the droplet size for that nozzle. Alright, now even though uh, we have talked about nozzle selection here. Like I said earlier, there are a lot of other variables that can affect your coverage and efficacy out in the field. Your speed is the very first one because as you speed up or slow down, your equipment has to maintain that application rate. So what happens is on the traditional sprayers, the one, when I say traditional, the one that do not have rate controllers, as you speed up, slow down, your pressure changes. When your pressure changes, it changes your nozzle flow rate and pattern. So anytime our pressure changes, it changes the droplet size, the spray pattern. So we're losing the coverage and efficacy that we're looking for, for that nozzle, for that intended pressure. Uh, the second thing um, to be careful about is also on the ground speed, these labels have some recommendations on don't spray over 15 miles per hour, especially with the bigger sprayers like they, the growers tend to go faster, pushing that limit 14, 15 or sometimes even higher. If we have the, the not, at, not the bigger sprayer, but like a small sprayer or the conventional sprayer, you know, sometimes even the label recommends not even going above 10 miles per hour to have the most effect out of that application. So make sure that when you're selecting the ground speed, as you're going through the field, it's not affecting your coverage and efficacy. And try to, in general, a very, um, a very good speed that we usually recommend is for a bigger sprayer even is maybe a 10 or a little bit under 10. That way you can getting the best performance out of your spray performance. Next thing is the boom height. And you'll see a lot of applicators running very high with the boom in the field and that's a problem because why boom height is a problem when we're selecting a nozzle if you pay attention there or even the formula that I shared earlier based on application rate that the application rate formula has a nozzle spacing in there and there's a reason why we use the nozzle spacing in there when we use these nozzle spacing, it's also looking for an overlap it's creating while we're running in the field. So anytime you go above the recommended height, you're not getting the same overlap. You're actually losing or you're doing too much. Plus, anytime your boom is way higher, it's creating a lot more drift and the spray is not getting straight to the target. It's drifting away from the target itself. So when you're looking at these tables to select your application rate on here, there is usually it says on the top here on this as example that these application rates and these speeds are for 20 inch nozzle spacing. So if you have a 15 inch or 18 inch, you also need to look at a different table. On the bottom here, it also says the recommended uh, spray height for, so the boom height for this one. So as an example, if we were at for a 20 inch nozzle spacing with a 110 nozzle, again when I talked about 
why the nozzle rating matters. This is a 110 nozzle, that's the spray angle, that's the fan angle. If you have an 80 nozzle, that will be a different spray angle. So that's why they specify if you have a 110 nozzle with a 20 inch spacing, your rec recommended boom height is 20 inches. Usually you can go up to 24, about two feet, but anything above that, you're losing the coverage that you're, uh, the desired coverage you plan to get out of the nozzle. So why the boom height is important is because it helps you get that coverage that the nozzle specifies there. The other thing that usually happens, especially on a big sprayer like that is, while your middle section can still be at 20, 24, your optimal height, but you have your wings on the on the side way higher running so that what's that creating is a lot of across boom variability within the same pass while you're doing a really good job of spraying it right in the middle but as your wings are closer to three or four feet on the ends there there's a lot of spray drift going on you're not getting the same coverage you're not getting the product on the crop there so make sure when you're running that your boom all the way across, does not matter you have a 60 foot boom, 90 foot boom, or 120 foot boom, make sure your boom is leveled all the way on that sprayer. So the last thing on the sprayer side before I move on the technology side is, we did talk about a lot of maintenance or checks on the sprayer itself is the environment. Make sure you be careful about or you know the wind speed, direction, and the temperature when you're trying to do your application. Usually on some of the herbicide labels, there is don't, don't spray this time of the day because of the high chances of inversion. So you need to ch make sure that there is not excessive wind speeds when you're spraying, but also there's at least a little bit of wind because the spray needs a little bit of wind, usually two to three miles to get the most out of, of the spray uh, sprayer performance. Wind direction matters because when you're running and if it's running across the boom and you're spraying right on the, on the end row or something, you're actually putting that spray on your neighbor's crop and that's why we have a lot of these issues with drift and that's why the label start recommending drift management is make sure you know what your wind direction and speed looks like when we're doing this a great example recently is as we have all these issues with drift in the dicamba they actually start suggesting you'll see in a dicamba label they recommended doing applications between one hour after sunrise and two hours before sunset so that way we don't have the temperature inversion and those issues and the minimize drift, uh, drift the, the highest drift management possible. Alright right, so the next section we're going to move in does not matter if we selected the right nozzle, we make sure our boom is at the right height, we checked all the lines, everything's working great but we still don't want to assume that we're putting out the right rate. So that's why the sprayer calibration comes into play. Why we calibrate? We want to verify that the selection we made, the speed we're going to run at, the pressure we're going to use, the nozzles are putting out the exact same rate at that pressure. So the most common method we use for sprayer calibration is called an ounce method or a, or a 128 acre method. And what, the, what it usually is, that you select your spray speed, your, you select your sprayer speed, the ground speed you're gonna run at, your pressure. You set those and you, there's a table here and UGA has these nice small spray calibration cards that there's this small table. The reason it's called the ounce or one eighth of an acre method is because uh, it's, it's trying to see how much we're putting out in 1 28th of an acre and it's giving us back a distance. So like when you use that table here as an example, this is the table that is also available on the card here, is you need to know your nozzle spacing. Let's say we're at 20 inches here and how much distance we need to cover to calibrate the sprayer for that distance. So as an example, we're at 20 inch nozzle, we travel 204 feet. So you take some flags, you mark 204 feet out in the field, and all you need is to put water in there. Don't, don't ever calibrate with the chemical in there. So you put that water in there, and 
what you do is the speed that you selected that you're gonna make the application at the pressure set the pressure on the boom and run the sprayer for that distance by timing it see how much time it takes to cover that distance come back note that time park the sprayer run the same pressure on there for that amount of time and there are these jugs available through different type of nozzle companies or you can buy you know at a home depot Lowe's tractor supply a calibrated jug which has an ounce uh, graduations on there the reason we're looking for that is the reason it's called one by 128 acre method is because in one gallon it's 128 ounces in there so they're trying to uh, they're trying to equilibrate this to like whatever you catch for that time that you ran the sprayer whatever you catch let's say we catch 32 ounces in that one second that is our rate right there we're putting out 32 gallons per acre if we catch 10 that will be our rate right there so that's one way of calibrating it and when you're calibrating it you just don't want to catch right in the middle here and say oh it looks good well guess what there's a lot of variability across the boom so what do you do want to make sure is depending on your boom width here you at least going to take at least every every other third to fourth nozzle so you make sure you check that rate and as you checking that rate you'll notice that the whole boom is not putting out the same application you will have a little bit but as long as it's not more than 10 percent of your target rate your average rate is pretty much close to what you desire to put out now also recently there's another method of calibration where technology helps us do it a lot better where you don't have to run the sprayer for a time you don't have to time it guess what there's this spot on meter that this company built where you can check your nozzle flow rate without even having running sprayer in the field or timing it all you do is start it there's sensors built in there all you do is you start it you have your sprayer at the desired pressure you want it and you hold it right under the, the nozzle and when it fills up it's going to tell you what's the nozzle flow rate look like so again you want to do this for at least 8 to 10 different nozzles for a 60 foot at least 15 different or 12 to 15 nozzles across a 90 or 120 foot boom so once you get your rate you can go back to this chart we used earlier let's say this tells me that I'm putting out 0.25 so that's the 0.25 gallons per minute for that nozzle we're putting out the very first section here GPM 0.25 is you see that the nozzle you selected the pressure you selected is that what when you made that nozzle selection is that the rate you were shooting for when you selected that nozzle if not you may want to go up or down on your pressure to make sure that you're getting the right rate so that's why I said we we sometimes assume that if we have done a really good job of nozzle selection here that our output is going to look exactly what the table says but there are again a lot of variables like pressure is the biggest one plus your ground speed that will affect that so make sure you can buy this from Amazon or online for about 150 bucks but this is a great tool where you can just go across the boom and check your nozzles before you make any applications okay now if you really want to take your calibration to a next level we're not just calibrating for the rate here you can almost go in the field and use these spray cards to actually check your coverage you can just throw them out if you're doing like a herbicide this will actually be on the soil or on the soil surface if you're doing insecticide fungicide you rather want to put this on the crops itself somehow stick them on there and make that application you can actually put these out while you're doing your chemical application you can do it with water else also but you need to put the dye in the water you have to use a different cards but these cards are actually intended for when you have the chemical in your sprayer and you're putting Where can we get those? oh sorry I'll, those are fantastic. I don't I'll make sure so I'll, I'll give it a uh, <laughs> yeah no sorry I should have started with that so you can get these cards T 
Keyjet makes those but Sagenta, your chemical company from where you buying your chemical should have these cards. There's a pack of 50 that comes with it. It's about 50 to 60 dollars depending on where you buy it but there are 50 cards you're not going to use them all during one so you can save them now they are water sensitive to make sure when you store them you really seal tight you know the the envelope you are ha you're uh, storing them in but the other great resource the why I said you also should check your coverage what we did on the spare calibration was we just calibrated it for the rate we're making sure we're putting out the right rate when the label says use medium to coarse droplet well gets what's gonna get give you your medium to coarse droplet this coverage so you can actually look at your coverage to make sure that are you getting those droplets that it's intended for so Sagenda I know we for research we like to use different apps to scan the cards but when you buy these cards they, they come with this handy little uh, I call it like a little printout um, that you can use out in the field and it has these boxes cut in which each box is like a one centimeter square half and a quarter so what they want you to do is and I'll have some some cards from our spray test here that we have collected the coverage data here and you can see how much like when we're doing either a fungicide insecticide application how much that coverage can vary even on the same plant so this is like the top middle and bottom and you can definitely see the difference between the top and the bottom or the middle and the bottom so some of the handy stuff they usually let you want to do is that you can use this once you made your pass you can pick up the card and you can line it up on there and you can count the droplets in there and when you count the droplets on the back of this card they have this little handy guide that hey if you if you're doing and they have this based on type of spray for fungicides and insecticides you need the finer spray more droplets to have a better coverage so they have this number of droplets per centimeter so when you count those droplets if it falls in that range right there then you're probably all right but if it's way outside if you're way low on the number of droplets that means you're putting a lot more coarser droplets if you're way too fine that means you're probably creating some drift or off-target movement so this is a very quick and handy way to check it in the field itself the other neat resource that almost everybody has today is this right here and there's an app called uh, spray snap card so what that app tells is when you open it up take a picture of the card it looks like that you go in there it lets you select the area you want to select and when you process it it tells you what your coverage looks like this one's telling me it's 8.2 that's fine I can throw it in a slide there this one's telling me 8.2 percent so this is all relative that does not mean exactly that I'm only getting 10 percent of the coverage so like for this card I'm getting a 10 percent coverage however like I said you look at the coverage difference between these two cards if I try to do the bottom card here same process process it's 3.3 almost one-third the coverage that's what we're looking for when we're doing this assessments in the field is are we getting a, when we talk about uniform coverage we're not getting a uniform coverage across the plant so that's why these cards really help you kind of get an assessment of when you're making these applications if you're having issues getting the right uh, control whether it's a disease insect or hurt or weeds you can kind of track back some of these things to make sure are you getting the right application rate are you getting the right droplet size are you getting the right coverage if your coverage looks like that if your coverage looks like that right there I'm assuming you're not getting any control at all you'll be very minimum and that could be a big cause versus if your coverage looks like something like that
so that's just an example that's just an example of the things you can take it in different steps to make sure that you are doing those applications in the most efficient manner anywhere starting from looking at all the sprayer doing the sprayer checks to taking it out to the actual when you're spraying the crop chemical look at the coverage on those cards all right so the last section I want to talk about on um, doing the getting the most or optimizing your spray performance is how can we utilize the technology that we have available to us today there's there has been a lot of improvements in this in the technology which let us do precision spray applications and I'll walk through some of the simple ones to some of the more expensive and even complicated ones but but every grower has a fit for some of these technologies even if you have a very basic or simple or conventional sprayers so the very first thing I want to talk about is the section control what does a section control means and this is usually available on a lot of sprayers so if I'm looking at this 90 foot boom usually my boom is plumbed in a way where it's broken into five different sections where does the section control help is especially when you're spraying around the field or you got waterways or any areas that you don't want to spray you can turn those sections on and off what that means is I can turn my outside sections off when I'm going on a, uh, when I'm on the field edges right because I don't want the spray there and that's how we also minimize the drift because we don't want to spray there so might as well turn those sections on when we're doing that job when we are going through a waterway or any other areas of the field where we don't need that spray we can turn those sections off that way we're not uh, affecting the water quality or spreading it in the areas that we don't need the pesticide at all in those areas the other technology is the GPS and the rate controller where does the GPS and rate controller fit in there is that's probably the best application with the sprayers is like I said earlier anytime you changes your speed out in the field and if you keeping up the same pressure your pressure also changes so that changes your application rate if you don't have a rate controller so what a rate control exactly does is does not matter if you slow down or speed up it keeps up the same application rate to match what are you going what is your desired application if you spreading uh, if you're spraying let's say 10 gallons does not matter if you have a rate controller you're driving at 8 miles or 12 miles the rate controller is going to adjust the flow so you are applying 10 gallons across the whole field if you don't have a rate controller you have a set pressure to get 10 gallons so anytime you slow down you're applying way more than it's intended to be and anytime you speed up you have the same pressure without a rate controller you're applying way less so that's where the best benefit is having a rate controller on a sprayer next technology is auto boom height where does the auto boom height come into play like I said earlier the boom height is pretty critical for getting the most coverage so the auto boom height are these sensors that get mounted on the boom where they're constantly sensing the ground and anytime they sense the boom is either too low or too high they readjust the boom constantly as you are driving in the field to keep your boom exactly at those 20 inches or two feet whatever your intended boom height is it compensates and it adjusts the boom while we're spraying out in the field all right the most up-to-date technology today on the spring side is called pulse width modulation so the reason we need a pulse width modulation is even when you have a rate controller when you are driving in the field as your speed changes that rate controller is adjusting the pressure to make sure that we're applying that constant or the desired gallons per acre we need to but anytime we change pressure it changes the nozzle droplet dynamics you change the pressure from 30 to 60 psi suddenly you're gonna go from a coarse droplet to a very fine droplet and you and you increasing your risk of off-target movement or drift so we need some mechanism where 
the rate controller should still be able to compensate while we're driving through the field but we still be able to maintain the same pressure across the boom and that's where the pulse width modulation comes in place what the technology is that each nozzle has a solenoid valve which cycles based on the rate but it keeps the constant pressure the nozzle is cycling the liquid so fast that it's turning on and off the application based on the speed while maintaining the same pressure across the boom that's the newest technology that a lot of growers are adopting it is a little expensive but if you're doing a lot of pesticide applications that's something definitely to look for depending on also the acreage you are spraying that how much time it will take for me to get a return on investment on something like that but also make sure that when you have some of those technologies they're also maximizing your spray performance you're not just getting your desired application rate you're also getting the app the coverage and the efficacy you need to get the maximum out of your spray performance one last thing i want to touch on because again the most one of the effective tools we all have in our pocket is this phone anytime we're going through nozzle selection spray calibration or even the app i mentioned about the snap card for coverage there are a lot of useful tools here i'm just going to share a few here and i'll throw these on a slide too it's just for my reference so tjet has a very useful app called spray select where it not only gives you the option of when you select application it asks you what type of application you're doing is it a herbicide fungicide insecticide the mode of action what is your nozzle spacing what speed you intend to spray at what's your desired application rate and when you put all that information in and say find spray tips it gives all the spray tips that match that criteria it it gives you a selection of two to three that best match that criteria and then further based on your own information experience you can kind of select that one nozzle from there that best fits your application so very useful resource doesn't matter you're looking right here right here this is more like you don't do the guesswork on the sheet here you put everything in the app that you need and it gives you the tip that does that job at that pressure rating so that's the TZ Wilger. Oh, Wilger has an app called Tip Wizard. Very same functionality. We actually have Wilger tips on these, this sprayer back here. It's the same thing. What is your desired application rate? Oh, what, what is your ground speed? What is your desired pressure range? Or droplet size. This even lets you select the droplet size. So as we going back to the label say, do medium to coarse droplet you can say i want to do medium to coarse select your application speed it's going to give you the nozzles that will do that job the other useful apps that we have now the tj app also has the spray calibration built into it so if you're doing the spray calibration while you're running in the field it has a timer it has the input for the speed so you can use the same app for doing your spray calibration the other app that will be pretty useful is called sprayer calibrator which is again just for the calibration app where you can go in the app select your pressure your nozzle type or your flow rate and use the information to actually calculate what type of gallons per acre you're getting on the boom and the last app again it is not from the spray calibration but again for if you are if you want to check your coverage with these cards if you do want to check your coverage using cards this that the app snap card is very useful for you to just throw the card out take a picture and it would tell you what type of coverage you're getting out in the field and if you need to adjust something to make the most out of your spray performance so that's all I have for today and uh, thanks for listening to the talk. Alright, so something like I talked about earlier is when you turn the sprayer on you want to make sure everything across the boom is working well. So something we notice on this is on the center section we got a nozzle that's not working, we got a couple more. You see the spray pattern on this one don't look exactly same as the other ones. 
and also if you look right here we got a leak right there in the boom itself so these are the things we want to make sure before we go out in the field to check for um, something else I want to show here is when we talk about pressure pressure in the cab is a little different than pressure on the boom so what I want to show is when we do the spare calibration that if you time it how much time it took for you to run in the field you want to keep at the same pressure and run the boom so you'll catch the liquid with the same nozzle what I want to show is the pressure effect on the rate so we're right about 25 on here so I'm going to catch this for about 20 seconds If we have to read this from our spare calibration method, we're still about 8 gallons. So we're putting out 8 gallons if we keep the same pressure here and spray out in the field with the conventional without a rate controller. So the reason I emphasize the speed or the pressure is that we're going to simulate a higher pressure with the same nozzle to see what happens if your pressure goes up and down. So I'm going to catch this again at a 40 PSI to show what the pressure does to our application rate. John, run it at 40. Run it at 40 PSI. If you notice, when he upped the pressure, our spray angle is a little wider now. And that's why I said when pressure affects spray pattern, that's what happens. So you want to run it at the constant pressure. So I'm going to catch this again for 20 seconds. If you look right there, when we were same nozzle, we were at a lower pressure, we were catching 18, 8 gallons. Now we notice we're about to 10 or 11 right there. So that's what the pressure which we are simulating speed here, how it affects our application rate plus the, back, the pattern. Something else you can notice right now since there's a little bit of breeze blowing, since we're using a little smaller nozzle tip, and we're at a higher pressure, we're creating a lot of fine particles which are drifting away. So this is not a perfect nozzle for anywhere we need a drift reduction strategy or we don't want to do too much drift. So if I have to select to go up, we would probably go up to like an 04 nozzle to minimize on the finer particles and try to get more coarser particles. All right, the second tool I'm going to show, which I said you can almost use this without running the spray in the field, is to check your nozzle flow rate. So if we're catching, there's the one method of using the jugs to do the calibration, or you can use the spot-on meter to check your nozzle flow. John, go back, turn it on at the same pressure. So you turn it on. Stick it right there. So it's telling us that that pressure that nozzle is putting out 0.21 gallons per minute. So if we have to use our spray chart again, we're on a yellow nozzle about 2025 we're a little bit higher pressure on 40 we're putting out about 
So this is another great way of verifying the nozzle calibration. He's at 40 psi, which there's a 40 psi. We're yellow nozzle O2, and we're catching 0.21, and it said the desired application should be 0.2. So we're exactly on that. Again, I said, make sure we do this all across the boom at different points, not just one nozzle. And then you can decide your ground, spur, the ground speed based on the type, the application you want to do for that. So if I want to put out eight or 10, I would probably run like six miles with that. Or like I said, since we're creating a lot of fines with this nozzle, we will go higher on a nozzle and then redo our nozzle flow to make sure that we are also meeting the medium to coarse nozzle drop the droplet size there all right so if we figured out from that that this is our rate is actually more than 10 percent higher or lower we got a couple of different options the first option we want to meet is the very first option we actually want to meet is are we still in the correct droplet size are we creating fine to coarse droplets if we're putting out a little lower rate we can increase the pressure that will increase our application rate but we also got to make sure we're not creating more fines at a higher pressure so the first thing would be see if increasing pressure like if we go from 40 to 50 the yellow box there is telling me I'm still in the yellow, the medium droplet size. But if I go as high as 80, then now I'm in the finer section. We don't want to do that. So you only want to increase the pressure until you are still within the same droplet size. Now we already noticed here we're a little bit more finer here. So what we would do is actually go higher on the nozzle size, which would be a 03 or 04. So we can get a lot of coarser and medium droplets at the same around 30 to 40 psi for a lot of drift management strategies you actually want to be on the lower side of the pressure more like 30 or 40 than more towards 50 or 60 and then once you have your nozzle changed you run the same pressure what you want to run at about 30 and 40 psi do your nozzle verification again to make sure you're putting out the right rate there and then go from there now if you putting out way too more and you have a very high coarser droplets and you want to back it off then again you can back off the pressure so that way actually you can increase the pressure there so you're not creating the larger droplets anymore but also you can back on the nozzle tip to create medium and coarser droplets at that pressure so there's both ways you can increase pressure or you can increase the nozzle tip size up and down to make sure not only we're again not only we're putting out the right application rate we're also in the right course to medium droplet which calls for a lot of pesticide applications so what we're what we're damning right here right now is the importance of the boom hide so when we're doing herbicide application especially our boom should be about 20 to 24 inches which is right there but like I said you can still see a lot of drift with that nozzle tip right here even though we have the right boom height right there but that's where we should be running the boom when we're doing a lot of herbicide applications what we're gonna demo coming back here is the incorrect boom height which we, we see a lot of time the growers running John, lower it down just a little bit before you come back. Uh, go a little bit up. Right there. So what you usually see a lot of times is grower running boom about that high. And if you can notice, see how much more drift we have right now with that boom. So all that application we're doing, the pesticide applications we're doing, it's going off in the next field or in the other field it's not even getting to the right crop right beside it and we're creating a lot more drift with this nozzle like I said earlier so make sure not just the right nozzle tip or the pressure the boom height makes also makes a difference because if you're way higher even though you're spraying on that pass but it's not even getting to the crop right there so that's why the boom height and we also need the right boom height 
to get the right no nozzle overlap to get our application right. If we don't if we have a boom that high, we're not getting the same overlap right there, so we're not even getting our application rate and coverage is just way too off from right there. My name is Simmerwerk. I'm the UGA Precision Ag Specialist with the University of Georgia here and uh, thanks for tuning in to listen to my talk today on how to consider some of the spray applications and utilize technology to have more effective pesticide applications. Thank you.